Thank you uh, very much, uh, Rhonda, and, and to Joe. And it is great to be a veteran of uh, communities in control uh, conferences like this. And they are so successful. I think they come up with great ideas, not the least of which is the uh, community idol. And I was uh, thinking as you were talking about that this morning, how uh, devastating that would be if that was introduced for politicians. If, <laughs> if the public could ring in on the phone and vote you out. And I, I imagine there'd be no one left inside a week. But today I want to talk about uh, Affair of Victoria. And as Rhonda said, uh, this uh, month, uh, just at the beginning of the month, we released uh, Affair of Victoria, which was the second instalment of our uh, longer term social policy, which we first released a year ago and uh, announced in last year's budget and then we continued that this year and that's really what I, what I want to talk about today. And what I want to indicate that if we're going to have a fair Victoria, absolutely central to that is having strong communities. And that strong communities are not only fundamental to having a fairer Victoria, but they are also fundamental to having a strong economic future for Victoria and Australia. And today I want to set out why as a government we have introduced our Affair of Victoria policy, but also put it very much on the economic agenda. So this is good social policy, but it's also good economic policy. And going back to the essential basis that underpins our policy of fairness and why we're emphasising it. Well, the first and most obvious reason that we emphasise fairness is because that is what we value as Victorians. I think we are a place that has a history of valuing a fair go, of valuing equity, and understanding that everyone deserves an opportunity to participate in all the good things in life. The second reason, and one that probably doesn't get as much prominence as it should, and I want to talk about today, is that fairness is fundamental to economic productivity. If we give more people a chance to participate, then we're going to harness all the great human capital that we have in our state, instead of letting that go to waste. And the third point is, from a government point of view, being very selfish, it's sound financial policy for a government because if we intervene early and support people in a fair way, we're not going to be paying as much down the track trying to pick up the pieces, whether it's in prison or people who are unemployed for long periods of time or people who are very unhealthy. Now, as a government, when we first came into office some seven years ago, our highest priority was the universal services, health, education, police, transport, those basic services which in the previous years under the previous government had suffered enormous cuts. And so we immediately invested large amounts of uh, budget money into 6,000 extra nurses, extra teachers, extra police, and we're now investing in extra uh, transport. And we do have some good results here in Victoria uh, to show that things certainly are improving. Uh, one area I highlight there, very important, the number of kids who finish year 12. Uh, when Joan Kerner was Premier and before that Education Minister, that was one of the highest priorities and we saw a big increase in the number of kids who were finishing school. But then through the 90s, with the cuts, that dropped back. So the kids that weren't going so well, that needed a bit of support, were being left behind. Now I'm pleased to say that we can point to the fact that our year 12 or equivalent retention rate has gone back up again. And we're up just over 85 per cent compared to a national average of about 82 per cent and we're up from 82.9 per cent in 99. We also have the highest number of apprentices from any state. Our crime rate is going down. And the last point, which I, I will come back to, but is very important, we are actually seeing the number of substantiated cases of child abuse in Victoria reducing, whereas in most states we're seeing a big increase. 
and I'll come back and talk a bit about that later. Having said that, the good news, there's also some bad news and some real challenges. And we presented this in a paper last year, the challenges we face about fairness in Victoria. About 150,000 Victorian kids live in families where no one has a job. Students leaving school before year 12 have a much higher rate of unemployment. And I was just talking about that before, the importance of children finishing school. Just look at that graph on the right there, down the bottom. That's the, on the, uh, on the uh, vertical axis, that's the percent unemployed. And on the horizontal, the year that the person left school. And what that shows, for example, if kids uh, who left year nine, at year nine have a, a short-term unemployment rate of about 22% and a long-term unemployment rate of about 15%. Compare that to kids who finished year 12 where the unemployment rates are about a third. I mean, there could be no more graphic demonstration of the importance of finishing school than that. But beyond that also, uh, we, we know here that the life expectancy of Indigenous Victorians is some 20 years lower than the average. And also people from particular cultural backgrounds, for example, the Middle East and North Africa, have uh, lower labour force participation rates. And we also, when we did the research, looked at particular locations around the state, for example, at employment. And what that graph shows is, along the bottom, a bunch of different municipalities, starting with Nilambik on the left and central goldfields on the right, matched against the unemployment rate. And you see you know, quite a vast difference. Now, overall in Victoria, the unemployment rate is now 5%, which was our target. It's a very strong position. But then when you go to particular locations, you see quite dramatic variations in that unemployment rate. So we see, for example, uh, in some municipalities there, unemployment rates of up around 12%, whereas in others it's down around 2%. And so we have a considerable concentration of disadvantage in some areas. Now, in some ways this is, for me, the most important slide because it's what we can do about it. What this slide essentially indicates that we need a strategic response to address disadvantage. A response that's based on fairness, our values. It's based on improving individual lives. It's based on investing now to avoid having to spend a lot more later. But critically, it's about harnessing the human capital, the great skills that we've got in our state. And if you look at the graph down the bottom, it comes from this document, which Premier Steve Brax put before the Prime Minister and all the state premiers at COAG earlier this year. Because we want to put this stuff on the national agenda. And essentially what that graph indicates on the vertical axis is growth, the amount of growth and new jobs we can create. The horizontal axis is the, is the time, so on the left it's now, and then on the right it's in 10 years. The purple area is productivity, and there has been very strong productivity improvement in uh, Victoria and Australia in the last 10 years. We are getting growth as a result of that, but the effort that we've put in there has just about reached the maximum in terms of benefits we're going to get. And the big gr growth, the big growth in jobs that we've identified is in participation in the workforce. And what that means is bringing more people into the workforce. It's keeping them healthy when they're there. And that's critical. So people can be healthy in uh, both their physical and mental health and ensuring that they've got the right skills. And if we do that as a state and as a nation, 
we can continue to grow and get good rates of new jobs and new prosperity. But it's really concentrating on that participation. And it is partly women who perhaps uh, are not getting real access to the workforce because of lack of childcare or lack of other community supports. It might be older people who have a lot of people, a lot of great skills to continue to provide to the workforce. It could be people with mental illness who uh, for many years uh, have not had the opportunity to work and to uh, use their skills. People with disabilities, the whole range of people, different people in our community with a range of skills getting the chance to participate can have enormous benefits. And so why does this matter so much? Well, we are in a challenging world. Uh, we see and hear in the news of factories closed and moving to China, of uh, challenges uh, for our agricultural sector. Uh, there are, we are in a very competitive global world. We're in a world of ageing population, uh, where despite uh, recent stories about massive birth rates around certain times of year, in fact, uh, our fertility rates are still generally fairly low. And so if we are going to boost the number of people in the workforce and grow our jobs, we're going to have to significantly boost participation. And that means giving everyone the skills they need and a fair go. So that's really the background. And Having said that, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the details of our policy, Affair of Victoria. The framework was launched last year and it has five key components. The first is access to universal services. And it's very important that we re-emphasise that. This is not about a separate system for the disadvantaged. This is about understanding that we're all Victorians, we're all Australians, and if we have good universal services, you can access them whether you're rich or poor, and that will mean that they're high quality services. And we know that, that um, you know, the old statement services for the poor are poor services has a lot of truth about it. The second thing, and I might say it was probably Rhonda who ensured that this was there, because I think in the early proposals it wasn't, so it was part of the consultation, the importance of reducing the barriers to opportunity. That it's difficult for people that, like myself that are very privileged to actually understand that there are those barriers for many people that are very hard to get through. And so we actually have to focus our policy around an understanding of those barriers. And it might be things like um, access for people with disabilities, or it might be for people uh, living in, say, the outer suburbs of Melbourne, lack of access to transport, either to get a job or to get to a service. They are real barriers. The third is understanding that there are disadvantaged groups, and uh, of probably most, um, the, the, the most emphatic is, is our Indigenous population, but there are disadvantaged groups that need support. The fourth, support for disadvantaged places, and I indicated on that graph the different employment statistics in the different areas. And fifth, making it easier to work with government, and I'm sure that many of you would agree with that. The other key thing we wanted to do, though, was, was reform the way we do things as a government. Not just do things the way we always had. And there are five key reforms there. Early intervention. Governments have typically only stepped in when the problems got really serious. So you build more prisons rather than intervening early. Second, giving the community the capacity to make decisions. Absolutely fundamental. Now, I don't have to tell this audience, but for many people in the community, that is a major reform, to understand that if you give communities the power to make their own decisions, you'll get much better outcomes. Third, and this is something we've really discovered, is the importance of linking infrastructure with community development. You know, generally speaking, governments have come along, built a road or built a school and not really involved the local community and then left, often not meeting the needs of that community. 
was if you actually see the building of that infrastructure as an opportunity for community development, you get a better result. Fourth, more localised services and partnerships. And fifth, making government easier to work with. And I do today just want to emphasise how absolutely fundamental communities are to each of those reforms. And if you look at uh, one example there, early intervention in families. I talked earlier about child abuse. We've now introduced a program called the uh, um, Family Support Innovation Program, which works with families where there might be a risk of child abuse, but it does so early early in the piece. And that shows, and the graph essentially shows that uh, the top little bit of yellow is notifications across the state, a slight increase in child abuse notifications in the period. The purple immediately underneath that shows a reduction in notifications in the areas where this program is working. And then underneath that, the next yellow one shows the substantiated child abuse cases which have fallen in Victoria in the yellow across the whole state, but the blue shows it in the areas where we have this program working, a bigger reduction. And the key to the Family Support Innovations projects is that communities identify people that might be at risk, and the community and the local agencies work together to help those families. And without that community involvement, we wouldn't get those good results. Another one here, which is uh, community capacity to make decisions, is critical. Neighbourhood renewal, one of our most successful programs where areas that are largely Ministry of Housing that have seen the housing and the streets pretty degraded need a fix up. Traditionally, government would have just thrown a whole lot of money, brought in the contractors and left, wouldn't have changed the community. Under neighbourhood renewal, it is the local community, the people that live in that area, that run the show, that make the decisions about the upgrades, about improving their streets. And you'll see there, those graphs show the decline in a, a range of crimes over the last uh, three years in drug use, loitering and vandalism. And you'll see how crime has come down markedly in that neighbourhood renewal area. And so, the community has an absolutely fundamental role in delivering a fairer Victoria. And I'm not going to go through all of those, but they're just an example of the many community programs, neighbourhood renewal, community partnerships, working with local government, working with volunteers and neighbourhood houses, where we're working together. Now, I just want to show a few examples, uh, some inspiring examples of people involved in community activities which work and where the government sees that it works. Uh, this fellow, uh, Derek Manning, lives in Bendock. I don't know if people know where Bendock is, but it's apparently about two hours north of Orbost. I didn't know you could get two hours north of Orbost in Victoria, but you can. And uh, he, they, they're a little town, very isolated, and of course the big issue for them is transport. And so Derek and the Bendock uh, Progress Association have purchased a community bus and at the launch of a Ferry Victoria he explained how it all worked but essentially you buy a ticket and you don't necessarily know where you're going to go but you get on and you go all day and it's great fun. <laughs> and uh, you know that, that but in terms of building a strong community and getting together that's worked tremendously well. The Sorghum Sisters, I don't know if any of you have had the enjoyment of being able to be at a function catered by the Sorghum Sisters. They are a group of women from the Horn of Africa, based around Carlton. They, a number of their kids went to the school there. We've got behind a social enterprise, a, uh, a business, a social business that they're running, a catering business. And uh, that is proving tremendously successful and giving them the opportunity to participate in the workforce, that very point that I was making earlier. And they're a group, a group of women, a group of women from a, an area that traditionally have probably had a tough time getting work. And they're now doing a fantastic job and partly through the support we've been able to give them. 
And then uh, another example, uh, young people uh, mentoring other young people and through Affair of Victoria we're funding uh, mentors to work with young people and to give them a bit of help along the way, a bit of advice and support and someone to talk to along the way. And that's a couple in Gippsland, Shelley the mentor and Vanessa from uh, Gippsland, part of the mentoring alliance there. And then at Lake Tyres, uh, we've seen some you know, quite terrible reports in the media about uh, uh, goings on in uh, various indigenous communities around the country. The uh, work that's being done at Lake Tyres has shown that when the community is given a chance, when government is prepared to invest a reasonable amount in housing and community facilities, you can start to really turn things around. And the example there is the breakfast program at Lake Tyres, which is reducing absence uh, from school, providing jobs for local residents and providing vocational training. And it really is working. I mean, the difference down there at Lake Tyres is, is quite palpable. So putting all of that together, uh, what we saw in the first year of Affair of Victoria was substantial funding, some $788 million in a number of key areas, mental health, disability, family violence, neighbourhood justice. This year in the budget, uh, a number of people beforehand said, well, are you going to continue Affair of Victoria? Will the government just see this as a one-off pilot and stop? Well, we didn't. In fact, we built and we expanded it. And this year we've invested $851 million through 82 new initiatives uh, to build on uh, reforms in key areas. Our major focus uh, this year, or major focuses this year are there, but probably the most significant is children and giving children the best start in life. And I want to talk a little bit about that and about some of those other aspects. Why do we need to invest in children? Well, it seems so obvious, doesn't it? Uh, you know, and I'm sure all of you don't need to hear this, but if you're talking to governments, and we're talking about investing fundamental, fundamentally large sums of money, you need a strong and rational economic argument as well. And this uh, graph is actually one that was prepared by a Nobel Prize winner in economics, an American from Chicago, Professor James Heckman, uh, who's a fairly conservative economist. But what his study shows is that investment in the years naught to five, which is over on the left-hand graph side of the graph, has a far greater return on the investment than, the, than if you try to spend money later. Now, you, know, you might say, well, it makes sense, it's common sense, you don't need to be a Nobel laureate to say that. But the reality is he's done all the research which proves it. So things like a good preschool, good childcare, early support for families is the best possible investment a government can, and community can make. And we had Professor Jack Shonkoff out here earlier this year who had an enormous influence on the government and many of us. And just to summarise what he said, services for vulnerable young children can have positive impacts on brain development that generate a significant return on investment over a lifetime. And so we really have to, if we're going to have a healthy society, if we're going to have more people participate, if we're going to have fairness, we've got to invest early in those early years, which is what we're doing this year. Another key focus this year is uh, areas of disadvantage. And we did have a particular focus on the growth areas of Melbourne. And I mean, you all know where those are, but just to give an example of some of the challenges in those areas. This is the uh, figures for postnatal depression, which show that in the growth areas of uh, Melbourne, the rates of postnatal depression are higher than in other parts of the state. And in a sense, that's not surprising, uh, where you have people, uh, in many cases, quite isolated, not good transport, a long way from services. Uh, in many cases, uh, the husband, father, 
working a long way from home, that sort of thing, you then uh, end up with higher rates of postnatal depression. Homelessness is another key uh, part of this year's uh, policy and uh, we do certainly need to do more on that in youth homelessness, which we are. Community transport, and uh, we saw the, the bus from Bendock, but we're certainly wanting to boost that. And this year you would have seen that the government has uh, produced a very substantial transport strategy that does include community transport. And this is something that came very much out of the people who are here today saying how we have these different forms of transport, community buses, hack services, school buses, taxis, if we can integrate them and get them providing the service that the local community needs, we can get, be a lot better off, and we are doing that. And multicultural communities uh, are another focus this year. I think right around the world, uh, there's a focus on the need for interfaith harmony, and that is certainly that I think in Victoria, we are doing a lot better than a lot of other places uh, in Australia and the world but we want to ensure that we continue to do that. And communities, once again, are a fundamental focus of Affaira Victoria. Uh, we're introducing a new program this year called Community Renewal, which is based upon our neighbourhood renewal program, where areas that have significant challenges, disadvantaged, the local people can run and direct a program to upgrade their community, working in harness with local government. And the other thing I'd just point out there is a very big boost for neighbourhood houses this year. Uh, and we believe neighbourhood houses are you know, absolutely the key to community support and development in so many areas. And so we've made a very major boost to them. So in conclusion, if I could just run through the major thesis that I've wanted to uh, put to you today. First, that a fairer society does improve our human capital. That human capital is not just about uh, the people involved, it's about boosting the whole economy as well. That community capacity is key to improving human capital that if we give people an opportunity through a neighbourhood renewal program to run a program, that's going to build up their confidence and skills, which is what we need to do. And therefore, in conclusion, as far as the government is concerned, communities are right at the heart of all our new programs. Thank you.